Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Howdy! Good to see you guys. Welcome. If you have a Bible, we are in Psalm chapter 1. And I want to read to you Psalm chapter 1. Uh, We'll pray and then jump in. If you don't have a Bible, I'm going to read it out loud. I think it's on the screens too. Uh, But I'll read it. We'll pray and then dive in to Psalm 1, beginning in verse 1. And it says this. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for everybody here today in, in this room, in the woodlands, everyone connecting into this moment. We're just grateful everybody's here. And thanks for a chance to look at your word together. And I just want to ask you now, God, as we do it, that you would quicken our minds, that we, we could think about it, understand your word. And I pray you would open our hearts, God, that we wouldn't just hear your word, but we'd feel it have the appropriate emotional connection with it that it might impact how we live. Uh, God, God, I'm asking that all of us, our entirety is connected into this moment, our minds, our hearts, and and our lives. And and we need you for that. We need your help. And I want to invite you, if you're willing, uh, to take a minute and ask him that. Uh, Talk to God yourself and say, God, please teach me something today. And then if you would, please pray for me, that the Lord would use me and I'd be helpful to you. Well, Father, we love you and we trust you. Use this time and we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, happy 5th of July. Uh, I hope you had a wonderful 4th last night. We had a great time. Uh, My daughters, who are two and three year old, uh, thought it was Captain America's birthday yesterday, <laughs> and uh, so we had a wonderful time celebrating him. Uh, happy birthday to the captain! And uh, I, you know, I don't know. Possibly, uh, one day I'll explain to them what the Fourth of July is actually about. Uh, that the reason we celebrate the Fourth is because that's the day that uh, the United States, our second Congress. Uh, what is it, Uh, Continental Congress signed the U.S. Declaration of Independence on July 4th, 1776. And uh, I don't know if you know the Declaration of Independence. I'm not going to recite the entire thing to you. I imagine some of you maybe have some memorized from your days in social studies or something. But I want to read one part I think we'll all recognize, uh, and it says this. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That was in our Declaration of Independence, that we believe God endowed us with the freedom and ability to, what? Pursue a fundamental passion, desire, right, which is to pursue our happiness. And so that's the part I want to talk about today, is that fundamental drive in us, the pursuit of happiness. And it's interesting because I want to talk about it looking at the Psalms. We've been in the Psalms together, and the Psalms, it's the Hebrew word for song. It's the song book of the Bible. So I do think it makes sense to talk about this basic internal drive in us to pursue happiness by using one of the most powerful forces that influences us, namely songs or music. Uh, because music is one of the most powerful things in existence. And if you say, well, Ben, that sounds a little overstated, just think about it. So much of what you think And how you feel is informed by and driven by music. 
Uh, it influences what you think about. I'll illustrate it this way. A, B, C, D. See, you all know it. Your most basic understanding of how to communicate started out. How did you even know the alphabet? You put it to a song and you remembered it. And for many of you, if you look into your mind, the things you remember from your past most vividly are usually the things put to song, right? Uh, like some of you don't even know your spouse's phone number, right? But if you're born in a certain day, you know Jenny's phone number, right? <laughs> Eight six seven five zero nine, right? Some of you, if I asked you where your parents were born, you would go, I don't know, you'd have to ask them. But if I asked you where the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air was born, you would say West Philadelphia, born and raised on the playgrounds where he spent most of his days. <laughs> Chilling out, maxing, relaxing, all cooling, shooting some b-ball outside of the school until a couple of guys were up to no good. And you would know the whole song, right? Why? You put it to music, it informs what you think about. Uh, that's why uh, Andrew Flesher uh, said it this way. He said, let me write the songs of the nation, and I care not who writes its laws. Because he knows that we don't know most of the laws on the books, but we know a lot of songs. If I can put my worldview to a beat, I can get it stuck in your head, and I can inform what you think about. So music helps us think about things, but not just think about it, to feel about it. You don't just uh, put on the radio to think about data. We do music because music helps us express our feelings and helps us feel feelings, right? So you'll see guys at the gym with their headset in and just... <laughs> you go, what are they listening to, right? Probably not easy listening, something a little aggressive, right? Uh, to get them all dialed up emotionally and to perform something, right? We do that. Uh, when someone breaks up with you, you don't just call your friends and go, you know, I've noticed that I'm a little sad because we're no longer together, right? You put on Adele, right? <laughs> and just cry your eyes out, never mind, never mind, right? Because uh, it helps you feel. Music impacts what we think about how we feel. Martin Luther, the great reformer, said it this way, music is to be praised as second only to the word of God because by her all the emotions are swayed. She is the mistress and the governess of the feelings of the human heart. And so that's why I don't think it's an accident that one-third of the verses in our Bible are poetry, music. Because the Bible cares about what you think about and wants to inform our thoughts about the world. But the Bible doesn't just care about what you think about. It cares about what you feel about. That God wants to impact not just information but affection because he knows what we think about will determine what we care about. And what we care about will chase. So what's in your mind? What do you care about? That'll determine how you live. And so the Bible will speak to us through a means that means something to us, song. And the number one song, the first song in the song book of the Bible, the Psalms, Psalm 1, which is really kind of sets the tone for all the rest of the songs in the Bible, is a song about how to be happy. That's what the song's about. Pharrell didn't write the first one. It's a song about how to be happy. Blessed is the man. That word blessed is the word happy. That every song is a response to something. And this first song in the book of Psalms is a song that's answering the question, how do we be happy? Which is extremely relevant to us because I think it's the question all of us are asking. We want to know how to be happy. Like if I ask you, parents, what do you want for your children? I imagine a significant percentage of us would say, I just want them to be happy. If I was to ask you kids what you want for your aging parents, you would say, I want them to be happy. If I asked you what you want for you, you would probably say, I want to be happy. We want that, right? That's not bad. And yet here's the interesting thing. Uh, there was a recent Harris poll that came out, and this is self-reported. Only one out of three Americans asked identified themselves as happy. That means they, they were asked a simple question, are you happy? Two-thirds of Americans said, no, I'm not, which I think is pretty profound. We all want happiness. We see it as fundamental in us to pursue happiness, but the vast majority of us would say, I'm not, I'm not. So we want it, we don't have it, and sitting in front of us is a psalm that says, and here's how to get it. 
And here's how the psalm works. It kind of revolves around two primary images. One is of walking down a path, and the other is an agricultural image. And it kind of moves back and forth between them both. And then it also alternates between sort of a negative and a positive way of looking at things. We'll start with the negative because verse 1 tells us what the happy person does not do. Do you want to be happy? It starts by saying there are certain things a happy person, a blessed man, does not do. And in verse 1 it says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. It says the first thing it wants to tell us about the happy man is that there's a certain clientele of people that he does not take their counsel. He doesn't absorb their advice when he makes decisions. He doesn't stand in their way. They have a way of living life that reflects a certain view and a certain set of priorities. He does not take their view. He doesn't adopt their priorities, and so he doesn't live their way. There's a certain clientele of people. He says, I'm not going to absorb your way of thinking because I don't want to absorb your way of living. And what's interesting is it uses this imagery of a path. He doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the way or the path of sinners, or sit in the seat of scoffers. It carries this idea of he doesn't journey down a path with them or a way with them. And you go, why use that imagery? Well, simply because of this. What do you do on a path? If you're on a path, what do you do? You walk down a path, right? That's the verb, you walk. Little decisions lead to a destination. Little steps lead to a location. That's, that's what you do on a path. You just walk a little, and it leads you to a place, right? Uh, that's like pathway 101. That's just how it works. So if I was on I-45, and I was walking south, I would eventually land in Houston. And if I looked up and went, now how did I get here? You would go, uh, one step at a time? I mean, you just... You were journeying that way. You were making little decisions that were going to lead you there. And if I said, well, I don't want to be in Houston. I want to be in College Station. You would say, well, farmer's fine. You would say, nothing you were doing was going to lead you there. The steps you were taking weren't going that direction. You were going a different direction. And your little steps led to a location. Your little decisions lead to a destination. That's how paths work, and that's how lives work. And so what he's saying is there's certain people that if I adopt their way of thinking and move down their path, it's not going to lead to happiness, satisfaction, life. If I'm influenced by the wrong people, it'll take me the wrong direction. And we all know that. Lonesome dove, which I really expected a, a, a more significant emotional response from some Texans about Lonesome Dove, man. If you live in Texas, it's, it's required. If not, read it, just watch the movie. It's even on Netflix now, it's free, Lonesome Dove. It's about Texas Rangers, right? I mean, come on, Tommy Lee Jones, Robert Duvall in Texas back in the day, right? And they decide they're gonna drive some cattle and it's these two retired Texas Rangers and their buddy who's an other retired Texas Ranger named Jake Spoon. And you remember Jake Spoon? Not a bad guy but a little malleable in who he listens to. And so he's trying to get to a destination and he falls in with a group of guys that make some kind of risky decisions, but he wants to be cool, so he hangs with them. They start doing a couple little illegal stealing things, but he keeps hanging with that group of people. They end up killing somebody. And he doesn't leave that group of people. And so finally he lands in a place where his friends capture this group of people and they got nooses around their neck. They're about to hang them. And Jake looks at them and says, come on, guys. You know me. I'm not a murderer. He says, I shouldn't be here. And they looked at him and they said, Jake, you ride with an outlaw, you die with an outlaw. You're going to ride on their path. You're going to end at their destination, Jake. That's all that's happening. They're just texifying Psalm 1. 1. <laughs> John Jones, one of the greatest athletes alive today, light heavyweight champion of the UFC, got caught snorting cocaine and ended up using drugs, smashing into a car, injuring a pregnant woman. And you look at that and you go, what happened? I'll tell you what didn't happen. 
the imagery is walking down a path. You don't go leaping down a path. You don't shoot out of a cannon to the end of the path. You're not sitting there at John Jones, heavyweight champ, Nike endorsements, all this stuff, and going, you know what? I'm a little bored with this movie. I think I'm going to snort Coke. That's not how it happens. But you look up at that moment and you go, the sponsorships are gone, the belt's gone, everything's gone. How did this happen? Well, I'll tell you how it happened. It didn't start with cocaine. It started way back here, man. It started with hanging with a certain crew and they start hanging out pretty late and probably some of your mind's like, I should head home. But then you don't want to look like a punk and head home, so you don't and you hang with them and things start to get a little seedier and a little riskier and maybe at some point they've presented in the context of even fear. You're too scared to try this. You're too scared to take a risk, a shot at this. And you go, no, I'm not scared of anything. And so they begin to couch it in a way where you decide there's something impressive or masculine about doing something like this. And then you look up all of a sudden and you're miles from where you ever meant to be. But it's a slow move. It's a slow move. It's the little steps that lead to a destination. And some of us hear that and you go, well, Ben, that's really enlightening. But some of us in here, and, and, and I'm not making a joke out of it, some of us in here have dealt with this of violence, murder, cocaine. But some of you go, Ben, I haven't killed anybody. I haven't snorted coke. So these are great illustrations I'll share with somebody, but that's not my life. But all of us have these. Perspectives we buy that if we continue walking in them, it's not going to lead to life. Right? Uh, I remember teaching this text to a group of college students. And I said, I can just imagine. And I tried it. I looked up at a group of them, stadium full of college students. And I said, I promise you, if I look at you right now and say, hey, guess what? You all want to be married, because they all do. And say... In 10 to 20 years, a significant number of you will walk away from your wife and your kids. A significant number of you. I guarantee you, and I could feel it coming off them, a bunch of them were like, how dare you, sir? Like, how dare you even say that to me? Like, they'd be deeply offended if I was at their wedding and said something like that, right? But I said, statistically, what's going to happen? Statistically, it's a guarantee. But I promise you, probably none of them or a very few of them will be thinking that at the altar. Not many of us will walk up to the altar and go, I don't know. I give this maybe five years. <laughs> we walk up to the altar with a totally different mentality and expectations. And what happens? Do we suddenly wake up one day and go, I'm done? No. Do some marriage counseling and you find it's little steps. It's you hurt my feelings and I tried to bring it up and the way you reacted to me I didn't like, so next time I'm just not going to share with you how I feel. Or if you share with me how you feel, I'll see it as an attack and so guess what? You don't share how you feel. And rather than us working through how to fight clean where we both get shoulder to shoulder and look at problems instead of pointing your finger and making the other person the problem, we'll just go, you know what? I want to keep the peace by not sharing with you how I feel. And so when I start to feel deeper things, bigger wrestlings, I'm not going to share them with you and it becomes a secret world. And all of a sudden, I look up one day and I look at you and it's not my beloved anymore, it's my roommate. And not just my roommate, it's a shackle. And so I start looking somewhere else for an oasis. And suddenly you land at a place you would have thought impossible a couple years ago. And I talk to people that look up and go, how did it get here? And I promise you, you look back, it usually starts at something very small. Little decisions lead to a destination. Now I say all this and you go, well Ben, okay, this is now probably a good time to define who are the wicked and the sinner because you get the sense of movement. He's walking with these different groups of people and it begins to progress. And, and I, I could unpack it all. I just want to make one statement about it. Who are the wicked? That word wicked is so loaded for many of us. You think of somebody like twirling their mustache in the dark or something. And you're like, well, this is the person that has that wicked person next to him. That's like, ha ha, let's rob a bank, you know? And that's not, that's not what this is. In the Bible, quite simply, what it's talking about, this pathway, this mentality, this life, the wicked is the person who decides and makes decisions without ever thinking about what God may want for their lives. The wicked person isn't someone who's slinking around in dark corners. The wicked person is the person who makes life decisions without ever stopping to think, what does God think about this? Does, does God have something to say about how I use this part of my life or how I enter into this kind of relationship? The wicked person, biblically speaking, if you read Psalms and Proverbs, the wicked person is a person who just doesn't take God's priorities into account. I'm not interested in what God says about this issue or thinks about it or how he feels about it. I, I'm going to do what I want to do. That's, that's the mentality. 
is I don't need to consult what God thinks. And if I don't have as part of my sifting criteria, what does God think about this area of my life? Then what do I consult to figure out if I'm going to do a thing or not? At the end of the day, my feelings. I just consult what feels good to me or what do I feel like will make me happy. And that's where you find a lot of people. That basic drive is in us. I want to be happy. So when we're pursuing it, they go, well, what do I feel like will make me happy? So I'll pursue whatever I feel or think will make me happy, and it will lead to happiness. But here's the great irony, is you can look through history, and it's replete with examples of people who, in their pursuit of happiness, cannot find it. It doesn't work that way. So, (laughs) Kid Cudi, who no one in the first service knew who that was, and that's fine. It doesn't sound like anyone in the second one does either. Uh, He was mentored by Kanye West, and he has an album called The Pursuit of Happiness. And he's talking about the fact that he's pursuing happiness, and the way he pursued it was success in his business, and he got it. He's mentored by one of the best guys in the industry, has some hit songs, made a lot of money, And so he was like, I just went for it. And you can read, listen to the song, Pursuit of Happiness. He's talking about the money and the parties and the cars and the whatever. And he said, I just went for it. I went for it all. And what's crazy about the song is he's singing about, I'm in the pursuit of happiness. He says, and I'll be fine when I get it. I'll be good. But then at one point, as he's talking about how depressed he is, he says, I am happy. That is the saddest lie. He said, I've pursued everything in my heart that I believed would make me happy. And he hits the distress of saying, and I'm not. I watched an interview with Jay-Z, one of the most successful people in the music industry today. And he was talking about that, growing up poor and struggling to make money. And now that he has a lot of money, it's been shocking him to look up and realize it was never the answer. And there's distress in his last album because he pursued everything he thought would make him happy, and he says it's not there. Jerry Seinfeld was interviewing Kevin Hart, two of the most successful comedians in the industry, and Kevin Hart was lamenting. He said, I grew up in a very rough neighborhood. He said, and then I worked hard, because I said, I gotta get out of this, and I worked hard to make money, and I made it and got out. And he says, and it's kind of weird for me to think about that all the things that defined me as a kid, living in this hard neighborhood, my kids will never experience. And as he's saying that, Jerry Seinfeld says to him, your life was bad, and you worked hard to make money to make it good. He said, now your kids will have it good, and their struggle will be, if I have it good, then why do I feel so bad? And they both nodded in agreement, which was amazing. They said, you know what's going to be confusing for your kids? They'll have everything, and they'll struggle with, then why am I so unhappy? And you know what's crazy about that interview? They leave it off there. They're both like, ha, you want to go get some coffee? And I'm like, wait a second. Hear what you're saying. The relentless pursuit of the accumulation of whatever I feel and think will make me happy is demonstrably not leading to happiness. That's the path. Over and over again through history, you can see it. And pursuing happiness, we're not finding it. There's something crazy about it. And so the Bible says, yeah, you can't find it there. So how do you find it? Verse 2. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. The happy man is the one who delights in the laws of the Lord. And notice the verb delight. It doesn't say there's people doing whatever they want and it's not working out for them, but the happy man is the man who grits his teeth and obeys the Bible. I don't care how you feel about it. You just get it done, sir. It doesn't say that. It says he delights in it. He loves this stuff. He reads this, and it says he's meditating on it. You bump into him during the day, he's thinking about it. You talk to him at night, he's thinking about it. He meditates on it. He's letting it dwell richly in his mind. William Wilberforce, the great abolitionist, had Psalm 119 memorized. He would sing it on his way to work. It's the longest psalm in the Bible. It takes 20 minutes to recite. And the guy just sat there and memorized it, soaked in it. Who's the happy person? The one soaking in the words of God. Now, you hear that and you go, well, Ben, um, so the happy guy is the dude that's fired up about the Bible. Uh, you're telling me the secret is to get really lit up by a list of rules? How am I going to do that? 
that doesn't sound, that doesn't sound possible. Well, let me say a couple things. Number one is form does bring freedom. That's the first maybe misunderstanding a lot of us have, is freedom is doing whatever you want. But it's not true. Freedom is not the absence of boundaries. It's not. We like boundaries to a certain degree, right? Music. You don't like it when someone just grabs instruments and starts, like, banging things. I'll hit anything I want. No, I kind of want them, like, in notes, you know, that are organized. And I like my songs a certain way, you know. Verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus. <laughs> Three and a half minutes, that's how I like it, right? That's, we like structure. We do. We like it. If you're having a house built, you don't want an architect that's like, oh, no, I'm just going to put some walls over in this area. You're like, no, 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 man, no, no. I want them in, like, certain areas that'll, like, support weight. We like structure. Structure brings freedom. So we like some level of form. And same with kids. Look at children. You want to talk to a bitter child? Let me tell you how to make a kid real bitter. There's two ways. One is to give them no rules. I talk to so many kids that have a deep pain in their heart as they're becoming adults because they had parents that didn't give them structure, and it hurt them. You want to make a kid frustrated, you give them no structure. The other way to frustrate them is to give them too much structure and just really tighten the screws and make their life horrible. You'll really take that kid off. And so it's somewhere in the middle of a form that brings freedom. That's what a kid needs. And that's what the Bible's advocating, right? A law that makes sense. And here's the second thing I would say about it. There's something interesting that happens in the book of Psalms. I don't get to unpack all of that. But over and over again, it says the law of the Lord is true, which is a weird thing to say. Because if you just think when the Bible says law, you think of commands, a command can't be true. You know what I mean? If I say the lake is over there, that can be true or false. If I say jump in the lake, you don't say that's untrue. What? It's a command. You just say yes or no. So, so commands aren't true or false. You see that? And yet over and over again, it says the law of the Lord is true. What does it mean by that? What it means is when the psalmist says law, he's not just talking about a list of rules. He's talking about a way to see life and interact with it. And when it says the law is true, what it means is it corresponds to reality. It fits. It makes sense. That's why this guy delights in it. You see it in verse 3. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, its leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. It says, this blessed, happy man is like a tree, a tree planted by water. Why is that good for a tree? Because trees are built to take in water. That's how trees are built. And as they absorb water, they're made to absorb water. And it makes them fully alive. It makes them the kind of tree they're meant to be. And so then what happens? It produces fruit. Things of beauty that bless others. And its leaf does not wither. When external circumstances become difficult, it has a stability beyond circumstance. And you go, trees are built for water. That's what makes a tree alive. But what if you said, well, I want my tree planted in some salt. So I'm going to plant it in salt. You can do that. But the tree's not going to flourish that way. What if you say, well, I want it to. That, that actually doesn't really matter because that's not how a tree flourishes. And you'll talk to so many people that say, you know what, I wanna divorce sexuality from my emotional content. So I'll use it online or in different ways or just kind of casual sex and I'll just divorce it from any emotional experience. You go, that, it's not meant to be experienced that way. So you can say, well, I'm gonna do it. The tree's not gonna flourish that way. You're just not built for that. You're not built that way. Well, I'm gonna chase money and stress out, but it's not gonna affect me physically. Ha, <laughs> yeah, it will. Trust me, you can't live like that. Body's not meant to work that way. You're going to break something. That there's a way a tree is meant to flourish. And as I admit it and say, okay, what's the best way for a tree to flourish? Water? Water helps trees? Okay, let me put the tree by water. <sighs> Burst with life. Because that corresponds to reality. And they're saying, what makes this guy so fired up is he knows, I didn't make this. I don't know how all this best runs but I can know the one who did make it. I can know how all this is meant to function. 
and I can plant myself in his word, and as I plant myself in how he says to live, I find that it really works, and it makes me a beautiful person and a fruitful person and a live person. That's why he gets delight, because it fits. And I remember years ago, my sister called me when I was like 22, and she was in her teens, and she was like, hey, I'm uh, in England, and I'm on my way to Italy. And she said, but here's the thing, I don't speak the language, I haven't done any research, I don't have any place to stay, but me and a friend are going over there unchaperoned, and we need you to meet us, because we need you to figure out like, where we're supposed to go and what we're supposed to do, because we don't know what we're doing. We're just two innocent, clueless girls on our way to Italy, bye, right? And she knew, as an older brother, that would induce panic in me. And as someone naturally built towards research, that panic would drive me into researching where they should go, where they should stay, and to go over there to take care of them, which is exactly what it did. So I went to Barnes & Noble and started researching all these books. Most of them were total garbage. They were just photos of Italy. And I'm like, I don't need a photo of the statue I'm about to look at. And like, yeah, that's him. Like, I need you to tell me like, how to get to him, because I don't speak Italian. And uh, finally, I found one. A book that didn't have a lot of pictures, didn't have a lot of cute, flowery language, but it just had data. It said, when you show up at the airport, don't go to the money changers. They charge too much to exchange your money. There's an ATM machine at gate three. Use that. It's a better deal. And I'm like, yeah, okay, all right. I, I see what you're doing. He says, when you show up there, don't buy your bus ticket outside. They mark it up 15%. You buy your bus ticket inside. You'll save money, and that'll take you to the train station to get you where you want to go. I'm like, all right. So I bought that book. So I'm studying that book. And I remember showing up at the airport, and this young girl walked by, and she was like, hey, are you going to Italy? And the book said Italy across the front row. Right? I said, yeah, I'm just reviewing the section about airports. She was like, your book has a section on airports? Like, yeah. She's like, my, my book doesn't. It just has pictures. I'm like, yeah, I know. Yeah, I've seen your book. I don't know what you're going to do. And she's like, can I see that? I'm like, yeah, get in here. So she's looking at the book. This other girl, y'all going to Italy? And I'm like, what's with these uninformed women going to Italy? Sit down here, love. And so we're all like reading this book together. Get off at the airport. I'm not making this up. These two girls that I just met are like literally like holding on to each arm. Oh, I got the book in front of me, and we're all like, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. Right, right, like walking around. And I'm like, the book says, if we go to gate three, we should look up, and there's an ATM machine! And it was there! And we use it! And then one of the girls was getting kind of frustrated with the whole thing. She was like, I'm just going to run outside because i got to get a butt ticket. And I was like, no, don't get the butt ticket outside 50%. And she runs out there. We buy ours inside. We get on the same bus as her. She paid way more for the same ticket. And I was like, ha ha! It's like, this book is awesome because this book is telling me how Italy actually is. There was a section in the book about how to go see Michelangelo's David in such a way that you bypass the line and get a private viewing of David. I followed what the book says. I passed the line, walked in there. It was just me, my sister, her friend, David. I mean, that's <laughs> unbelievable. Walked out, there's a line around the building. And I'm just all like, you guys got the wrong book, son, right? <laughs> you can look at our pictures from the trip. The book is in every picture. It's like me at the Vatican, like, ah, book, right? <laughs> I loved it. Loved it. Why? Because it was helping me navigate life well. This book is telling me what is, right? And that's why this guy delights in the law of the Lord. It's not just that he loves a book. He, he's getting to know the God who's telling him how we're meant to live that will make us most fully alive. And you know some people like this, that you say, I know, maybe you know one or two people like this, that you say, when you say a person's like a tree planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in season, and its leaf doesn't wither, you go, I know somebody like that. And it's not just someone who calls themselves Christian. Anyone can call themselves that. And it's not just someone who reads the Bible. You can read the Bible and be a jerk. You really can. But it's the person who delights in God. And notice it doesn't say the person who just obeys his commands. It says the person who delights in the words of God. They, they drink deeply of the thoughts of their maker. That's the person you call when your life's collapsing. And you say, how do you do it? That's the person when they speak to you, you go, you always seem to have the right word to say. It's like the fruit's right there. It is. That someone who dwells in the thoughts of God has life. And when other people's situations change, the leaf withers. This person has a river. They have the words of God that gives them strength and stability beyond circumstance. That's the happy person. I'm dwelling deep with my maker. The wicked person is not so, 
And what's fascinating is it stays in the, arch- the agricultural metaphor, and it doesn't say he's like a tree by the river, he's like a tree not by a river. It says he's like a tree by a river. Its leaf doesn't wither, there's stability, it bears fruit, there's fruitfulness. And it says he is like chaff. Chaff is the little dry husk on a kernel of wheat. The way you get rid of chaff is if you got a big pile of seeds with all the little husks on them, you just throw it up in the air. And that little seed has enough weight to drop on the ground. The chaff is so weightless, so substance-less, it floats away on the wind. He says, this person is stable and fruitful. This person is dry and disappears. It's not funny or cute, it's scary. There's a way of living life that doesn't have a stability, doesn't have a life to it. He says, that's the person who blows off the God who made all this. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. The righteous made the decision not to stand in a certain way of living and thinking. The wicked person at the end will not have the choice. He doesn't get to stand in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. That knows is not just aware of. It means I know you. The blessed, happy person delights in the words of God. Why? Because he or she knows God. And God knows them. Now to close, you go, how do we get here? If what you hear this morning is, there's two ways to live life. Don't read the Bible and do whatever you want, and it doesn't lead to life. Or read the Bible and obey everything it says, and you'll be happier. That's not the sermon. The sermon is, dismiss God and live however you want. That won't lead to life. But it doesn't say, so obey all the rules and you get life. That's not what it says. This person meditates on the words of God. Because if you meditate on the law of God, the law of God was not simply a list of rules that David was talking about. It's the first five books of the Old Testament. You got Genesis, you got Exodus, God liberating his people from slavery. God gives them the Ten Commandments. So you do get a moral law, right? And the moral law of the Old Testament, much of the moral law, if you read it, it's actually really good. Like if you and I were on a desert island, you would want it. You know, it's laws like if you lose your donkey, go help you find it. That's not an oppressive law. It's not like, how dare you? It's like, that's basically like the cool thing to do. If your neighbor loses a donkey, help your neighbor find it. That's just the cool thing to do, right? Much of the Old Testament is summarized that way. Just be cool to each other, all right? And yet right next to the moral law is the ceremonial law. And the ceremonial law was stuff that were pictures, images, destined to one day be replaced by the real. And the pictures and images were of a sacrificial system. It's built into the law. It's right there next to it. Exodus, the moral law, is followed by Leviticus. What's Leviticus? The Levites of Leviticus were the priests. What did the priests do? They sacrificed innocent animals as an offering to God because of your violation of the law. That's part of the law. So what's the assumption in the law? Here's the moral beauty that God desires for us. Here's everything to do when you don't live up to that. The assumption in the law is that you can't keep it. That's why the psalmist doesn't say the wicked person doesn't obey and the righteous person does obey. It says the wicked person doesn't obey. The righteous person reads the law and sees in it the beauty of God and says this is the way the world is supposed to work and also sees in it, and none of us has done that. All of us have, like sheep, have gone astray. All of us have gone our own way. All of us need a shepherd to come get us because we're lost. And that's what the law presented. We need an innocent one, one who did perfectly obey the law in the way we didn't. And we need him to take on the judgment and the death we deserve for the path we walked. And that, all that ceremonial imagery of the Old Testament, Jesus said, that's about me. At the very beginning of his ministry, John the Baptist looked at him and said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. It says, Jesus is the sacrificial lamb, the one who never took a step down the way of the wicked, but will take all the repercussions of it. The judgment, the death, the Loss of life inherent in this way of living, though he didn't walk a step on this path, he will absorb it all. He who knew no sin becomes sin for us, that we might be made right. 
So the call of this sermon is not clean your life up and do better. It's to feast on the words of God because in them you see the Son of God. You see Jesus Christ who lived the perfect life we could not, died the death we deserved, and then extends his hands that says what you need more than anything is to know me, to know the Son of God, to know God. And when you know us and we know you, then you commune with us in my word and I promise it will change you. Christianity, I love the way Tim Keller says it, doesn't have the door at the end of the path. Walk this path and eventually the door will be opened. He says only in Christianity is the door at the beginning of the path. Step into a free relationship with God and watch your life change by his power and his glory. And so the beautiful life presented to us, the happiness afforded to us is found in an intimate, vital communion with God. And as I read his word, as I peer into his beauty, I become more like him. That's where our joy and our life is found. Let me pray for us. Lord, I wanna thank you that you're honest with us. All of us are, are beautiful because we're made in the image of God. There's value to every human being. No matter what they've done or haven't done, there's something valuable, dignified, beautiful about every human being because we're made in your image. And there's something broken about every human being, something deceived, something marred, something broken. Because God, even though we were made to know you and walk with you, we have wandered down many dark roads. And we could point and say, well, he walked further she walked down a different one that's worse, but we've all, like sheep, gone astray, each on his own way. And God, you laid the chastisement of our iniquity upon him. You put it on Christ, that he lived the perfect life we couldn't. He died the death we deserved to come and like a good shepherd, lead us off the path of destruction and bring us into life. I pray for any here today that doesn't know what it is to be brought into the family of God by the Son of God, Jesus. They would come to know you this morning saying, Jesus, I want you. I want to belong to you. I want you to forgive me, cleanse me, lead me. And then, God, for those of us who know you, may we feast on your word. May we open up the gospel of John and say, I'm not going to pick out a list of rules. I'm going to look at the Son because the more I peer at Jesus Christ, the more I become like him. His beauty is enrapturing. It is a delight for those that are known by God and know him. Might we be a people who feast on your word because it makes us truly, fully alive and a blessing to the world. We ask that in Jesus' name. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group Director, and I'm here with Bible teacher Ben Stewart, who just brought the message on Psalm 1, The Pursuit of Happiness. Welcome, Ben. Hi, thanks. All right. Well, um, this message certainly generated a lot of questions. Great. Right? So we're going to cool. be taking a look at um, quite a few things from what you talked about today in Psalm 1. Um, the number one most popular question that we need answered first, though, is what is the title of the book that you reference that you yeah. used in your trip to Italy? We're, we're dying to know. <laughs> That's great. So glad people asked. Uh, that was uh, Rick Steves is his name, and he does uh, all different parts of Europe. Rick Steves. Okay. Got yeah. it. All right. So. For those of you who are going to Italy... Trust Rick, he's good. He's Go, very good. Grab the book. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's get into a few more questions. Okay. Um, we had several come in around um, getting into the Bible and getting into God's Word. Whether you are a new believer and you're new to Christianity or you've mm -hmm. never really studied the Bible before, where do you start? Right. And then secondly, if you've been studying the Bible for a long time and you've been in prayer but you just don't feel like you're getting the answers, can you answer questions around that? Yeah, absolutely. Where do you start? Um, <clears throat> I would say um, one thing that's interesting, I mean, you look at like the early church, most of them were illiterate. So the idea of just me and my Bible alone was not how they worked out spirituality, which is pretty impressive if you think mm. the entire Roman Empire changed under this community and they didn't necessarily have private devotions. What they had were 
frequent connections with each other, mm -hmm. speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And so what you see often in the Bible is we're coming around the words of God together. We're speaking the words of God together. So if someone's saying, it's just me and my Bible and I'm totally lost, I go, okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I, I think they would have read the Bible alone if they could have. I think it's good to read the Bible alone. But I would say the first thing is study the Bible in community. Mm -hmm. um, so get in a small group would be the first thing uh, at your church where people are studying the Bible together. Uh, and then in your own study, I mean, definitely read the Bible on your own, but add in commentaries because that's a way of inviting people in that have mm -hmm. studied it. They can give you insight. There's a website, and I'm totally serious about the name. It's called bestcommentaries.com, and it really is the best commentaries out there. It's unbelievable. Uh, and I would recommend going there and checking those out. Um, beyond that, I would say... Something that some people feel maybe is a little insulting, but I found profound, our family's reading through it again, is the Jesus Storybook Bible by mm -hmm. Sally Lloyd-Jones. It kind of, it's, it's written for kids, but she's helping you see how the whole Bible is one story. My kids too. It's extremely helpful mm -hmm. for everybody. I know college ministers that take believers through it uh, of all ages, because it's so helpful in saying, oh, that's how all this fits. Mm -hmm. And so I would read that as part of it too, you know? Uh, I would say for us at Breakaway, we developed an app that you can download our Breakaway app. It's a shameless plug, but it's free. Come That's on. That's awesome. Um, but uh, we give people Bible study tools of how to mm -hmm. study because that'll mm -hmm. help you. And from there, I would say John is a great gospel to read. Mm -hmm. Ephesians would be a good epistle to read. Take little bits at a time. Uh, but you can download our app, and I'll give you a lot of details on how to study. But first and foremost, I would say do it, do it in community. And then when you're alone, get some good resources. That's awesome. We have a couple of girl groups doing your Engage the Word. Awesome. Together. See, there yeah. you go. So, Come on. Thanks. Good. Um, get both of those. Okay. So uh, let's talk about a couple other questions. Um, one, two or three, all around the same thing. People, how do you minister to people in your life who are not following the way of the Lord? Would mm -hmm. be considered under what we were talking about today as wicked, whether it's your spouse um, someone in your close relations with, and then the relationship, you know, as a wife with a spouse who's not right. walking with the Lord. Um, yeah. What do you have to say? Um, well, in a short question, I probably don't have enough time to do justice to wanting to emphasize empathizing with that person. That's a very, that is a difficult spot. And I think having other believers around that can love and encourage you, because that is challenging. When you say the person I'm bound closest to isn't going the same direction. It creates a lot of tension. And what do you do with that? And the good news is for, for the person who's married to someone that says this person is not a believer, the Bible does speak to that. 1 Corinthians 7, mm -hmm. 1 Peter 3, speak directly to that. 1 Corinthians 7 is, as far as it depends on you, stay. And 1 Peter, Peter talks about it. He's, and, and specifically, he's talking about wives. He says, wives, be subject to your husbands even if they do not obey the word, that you, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see you, your respectful and pure conduct. And so he's talking about it's going to be difficult, but as much as you can, live in a way that what they see is your respectful and pure conduct, which is really interesting. He says that Treat them in a way that they feel respected, that you're not uh, always chiding them about what they're not doing, hmm. so that the basic message to them is you're not enough or you're not hmm. sufficient. As much as you are able to, what I tell people, and this goes for friends, not just spouses, is find the things in their life you can celebrate and celebrate those as much as you can. You know? So I would say with common friends, that you say that person's living a destructive life, my spouse is not following the Lord, I'd say, find the things around their life that you can celebrate and celebrate those. Hey, you're good at this. I love watching you do that. Hey, when you did that, that was so awesome. Thank you. Not with a hint of, and you should maybe do that more. You know, like just, just mm -hmm. celebrate them with nothing attached uh, because people feel valued. And then I think you ask honest questions. You care about them. It, it, all this fits under the general category of grace. Uh, I am as gracious to them as I can be, celebrating what I can celebrate in their life, loving for them, anticipating their needs and meeting them, 
showing that person I care. And then in this text it says, and live a pure conduct, but live a holy life because as time goes on, they're going to see that works mm -hmm. better. Yep. And he's saying, stay in there and be a display. That's a very hard thing to do, mm -hmm. but do your best at it. And, uh, and there's a lot more I should say, but that's kind of the general category. So I would say don't do it alone, but when you're in there, love them sincerely and then live a pure life. And uh, I think that's what helps people. And then, like Peter said, be prepared to give an answer. Uh, I tell college students that all the time. They'll come to Christ in college and come home with a sermon, and it never lands right. It's always insulting to their non-Christian parents. Mm -hmm. I say, don't even do it. I say, you go home, and you be respectful to them. You listen to their advice because they have something to offer. You obey them. You honor them. Then you do the dishes. Mm -hmm. You mow the lawn without asking. They're going to go, what is happening? <laughs> you know, because that's loving somebody. And as they see your life over time, Usually what I find with parents is they minimize it, they mock it, they're mystified by it, and then they begin to ask about it. And they want to hear and it. And then they, yeah, <laughs> over time, as you stay consistent, um, and uh, they see this is a beautiful way to live. But uh, hang good. in there. Good, yeah. en good encouragement. Um, so this question came in. I suffer from bipolar disorder, and when I read Psalm 1, I feel like it, the second half describes my life. Mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult for me to believe that God sees me differently, and it's very hard for me to see myself differently. So from someone who's coming from this perspective or this struggle, um, where's the hope in this when your mind kind of works different than what we're talking about in yeah. Psalm 1? Well, I would say Psalm 1 in some ways feels too simple. Here's two roads, beyond this one, not that one. And some people go, oh my gosh, life's way more complex than that. And you go, yeah, that, that's why it starts there. But there's 150 Psalms. And you see people that love God truly wrestle deeply in the Psalms. And so I would say keep reading them because you see where there's not as much of the grittiness of life in Psalm 1. It shows up in later ones. But what also shows up is a God that doesn't give up on us. Mm even when we're failing in every capacity. So um, I would quote, there, there were, uh, someone mentioned that question to me, and I just want to read over you two Psalms. Psalm 78. Psalm 78 is about how God loves his people, and it's basically a history lesson, and he gave them his law, and he loved them, and then it just recounts all the way they blew him off, were self-destructive, hurt their kids, basically made a mess of their lives, and how God always moved back towards them with grace. And it says in it, yet he being compassionate, atoned for their iniquity, did not destroy them, restrained his anger, did not stir up his wrath. He remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passes and comes not again. And then Psalm 103 says, he does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we're dust. And so twice the psalm says that he knows what you are. He knows that you are but flesh. He knows our frame that we are but dust. What's it saying there? I know you're weak. I know you're frail. I know the physical ins and outs of that frailty. I'm aware of it. And I move towards it like a father who compassionately loves his child. So I would say if that inner voice is presenting to you a God that's other than that, a compassionate and patient father, make war against that mentality with the truth of mm -hmm. Psalm 103. And then again, I would say don't fight that alone. Often. We can read the Bible on our own and try to make ourselves believe it, but that voice of condemnation is so loud, we need some other people to speak it to mm -hmm. us. No, you are forgiven. No, you are loved. And hearing that from another human being makes it easier to believe. If that person external from me cares about me, it's easier to believe that he does too. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I don't think God is... Uh, harsh or cruel with those who struggle. Now there's a lot to being bipolar that, that we're not getting into by saying it that way, but that's where I'd say to start. 
John Bunyan is someone I think has been really helpful too. He, he didn't have that language of bipolar. He was an old Puritan guy, but he struggled deeply. And you can read some of uh, his Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners was about his struggle and ultimately finding rest in the grace of God that abounds even for the chief of all sinners. Good. And this goes a, a, a lot along with the next question, which is what does God say about someone who decides to go so far from him that they choose to take their own life? Uh, yeah. Um, I would say um, taking your own life is roundly condemned by the Bible. It, whenever you see someone do it, it's presented as the wrong decision, a bad way to go, not a good thing to do with your life. So I, I want to be clear, God is not happy with that. Your life's a gift and it's not yours to take, you know. Does that mean, so if you do, no matter what God was doing in your life before, it's a direct, go direct to hell card. There have, have been traditions that have said something that's the unpardonable sin. I would not say that. I don't think the New Testament presents any unpardonable sin. Jesus does talk about a sin that's not forgiven. But if you read it in context in the gospel, the sin that's not forgiven is what? The rejection of him. Hmm. Not believing that I'm the Messiah. He says, if you reject the spirit of God is working through me to show miracles, to testify that I am God's Messiah. You reject the spirit, reject me. You've rejected God. There's nothing for you. So that's what he presents as the unpardonable sin, rejection of Jesus. Can someone truly know Jesus and in a moment of despair make a horrible choice? I, I think so. Would God condemn them? I don't think so. There's no clear passage that says he would. So I think there's grace and there's hope, but there is in, there's no permissiveness. So if someone's struggling, they need to go get help. Uh, that is not the way out that God is looking for you to take. And so with this, we kind of go back to the, the last question kind of brings us back to the theme of Psalm 1 and the pieces. Um, does our desire to pursue worldly happiness, is that what leads to self-destruction or self-destructive behaviors? I would say the word worldly is important there. Like, should we pursue happiness? The answer is yes. It matters greatly what object you're pursuing it in, you know? Um, and so God wants you to be happy. Mm -hmm. God wants you to pursue happiness, but in Him. And ultimately, that's where true happiness is found. That's what Psalm 1 is about. It's the misuse of God's world, the misuse of your life in your pursuit of happiness that will be destructive for you. So yeah, I, I don't know specifically what they're asking in mm -hmm. that question, but I would ask, what are you looking for? And um, I promise you, God knows how his world best fits together. And when he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said, you love me and you love people. And I promise you, you lose your life for my sake. You're going to find it. Mm -hmm. He said, if you, if you self-sacrifice, put yourself under me and trust me, your life's going to end up in a way better place than you can even imagine. You go, no, I want to do it my way. There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end is death. So I don't know how to be more specific because I don't know the specific question, but I would say your pursuit of happiness is not a sin. Make sure you know what object you're pursuing it in. God wants you to pursue happiness in Him, mm. right? Yep. That's the idea. Awesome. Well, all of these were great applications yeah. of Psalm 1 and, and different struggles. Um, thank you for being with us again today. Sure. It's always a pleasure to it's have fun. you with us. And thank you for all your questions today. We'll see you back here next week for Postscript. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.